Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. Humanity's War Songs, written by Wendertoast. Humanity is an oddity amongst the galactic trade community. They are militaristic, but will cling to peace for as long as possible. On several occasions, I have seen the United Human Front take bad deals and concessions in stride, all in the name of preserving peace. They have rarely used their military for much more than anti-pirate action than peacekeep, only stepping in when species are threatened with extermination. Due to this, they are viewed as some of the best mediators in the GTC. This strange behavior is what drew me into becoming a Xeno-historian. My species, the Rygaxians, were known as the Galaxy's Peacekeepers. My species are what the humans described as Minotaurs, a monster from their mythology. Though the luckily do not see us as monsters, we are even tempered and fair, but are more than willing to go to war. I believe the humans refer to it as speak softly and carry a big stick. I quite like that saying. My time in university was enlightening. I was fortunate enough to qualify for an exchange program and was sent to a human university on the first planet that they colonized, Alpha Centauri. While there, I mingled with humans from countless cultural backgrounds, but found something in common with all of them. They had all lost family in one war or another. Fathers, brothers, uncles, sisters, aunts, grandparents, and great-grandparents all humans I had talked to had lost someone in their life. This revelation made me dig deeper into humanity's history and culture, stumbling across the many war songs. Now, every non-passive species has war songs, but humanity was different. Their songs did not glorify war, they abhorred it. My roommate Kyla introduced me to several of these songs. They were ancient, coming on what he called compact discs and required ancient hardware to play. Yet, the quality was still phenomenal. The first song that he played me when I asked about human war songs was called One by the band Metallica. The premise of the song still causes existential dread within me to this day. It even influenced me to fill out what humans call a DNR, ensuring that I would never end up like the subject of the song. He then showed me Passchendaele by Iron Maiden. The only way I could describe it was the desperate ballad of a dying soldier. These two songs alone both frightened me, yet intrigued me, pushing me to look further. That's when I started asking around my dormitory, seeing if anyone was willing to sit down and share with me. To my surprise, people were more than willing to share, showing just how friendly these primates were. The next people to share with me was Elizabeth and Maggie. They shared songs from their small countries, starting with extremely ancient ones. The song was from what they referred to as the First World War, and was sung from the perspective of a grieving mother proclaiming that I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. The song proclaims that mothers didn't raise their boys to take some other mother's darling boy, and that there wouldn't be any war if mothers had to say. The next song that they shared was from a period of the collective history known as The Troubles, a period of religious and political hostility between two groups. The song The House of Orange is a very passionate call for peace. The last person I talked to was a main Mikhail and came from one of the former superpowers on the home planet of Earth. The things he showed me forever soured my honorable view of war. He showed me music videos that had been saved from humanity's old data network before it was wiped out during the third and final world war. The videos he showed me churned my stomachs. I watched as boys no older than us were piled like firewood in the back of trucks and in mass graves, like charred bodies, their dead eyes staring back at me, of a vehicle crew taking their brother in arms out of the back of their tank, his mangled leg dagged as they carried him out, of corpses littering the streets as buildings smolder in the background. I asked him what war caused this, and what he told me made my jaw drop. These videos were not from war, but as an assault on a single 
city. The song was aptly named Soldiers Are Not Born. He later played me a radio communication from this assault, and the pure desperation within them made my eyes tear up. The first one he played me was a radio conversation between opposing commanders, with the defender begging the attacker to not sacrifice his men's lives in a pointless attack. He begged the attacker to come as a friend, and that if they met in battle, he would not show mercy. Mikhail told me that attacking commander and all his men were wiped out within 60 hours. All of these sung painted a vivid picture of humanity's view of war. They awe hit, but that left me with another question. If they have such a strong distaste for war, then why have they such a large standing army? On the scale of things that they could easily stand toe-to-toe with us in every way, yet they were hesitant to use it. After university, I became my people's cultural advisor on the topic of humans, and thanks to the privileges that came with this position, I was allowed to access the many archives that humanity held. Unlike most species of the galaxy, they did not possess a clear history of their past, much of it being wiped out in what they called the Third World War. Due to the fission weapons used, though they say there was limited amount compared to what they could have unleashed, many of their digital and physical archives were lost. This would have spelled death for a species if it had not been for the generational ship sent to Alpha Centauri mere decades before. The history I read, and the many more songs I listened to, only made me more confused. I found many songs calling men to arms, though it was explained to me that they were propaganda songs. My questions were soon answered by an old senator that's father had been alive during what the humans called the Phoenix Years. He told me an old human adage, Sivus Pacem Parabellum. He told me that it translates to, If you wish for peace, prepare for war. This phrase finally answered the question I still held. Men of Story Story number two Simple Precautions, written by Sparrowhawk. Twin trails blazed orange fire across the afternoon sky, as if sunbeams were frozen in place behind the distant ship, stark neon against the dark clouds. They had watched it for several minutes, pausing their farm work to bear witness to the ship's approach. Sweat still prickled their skin. The village elder had called for Roy so that the former soldier would hazard a guess to the intentions of the uninvited guest. Orange beam streak, twin-cylinder thrust Yamari Alcaron C3 engines, modified cargo hold, looks like extended. He handed the binoculars back to the elder, rounding. The assembled villagers crowded close, waiting for his judgment with eager dread. When did we lose contact with Farhope? asked Roy. Two weeks ago, about. And Claretown? Last Thursday, weren't it? The ship was getting closer. Its angular shape could now be barely made out. Bizarrely, molded colored, it looked almost like stacks of shipping containers fused together. Had my wings extended to save fuel out of vacuum. Roy sighed heavily. That's the reason right there. Slaver ship, very likely. Coyuvan, perhaps. Or maybe even Haran Zararizi. Suspicions confirmed. The expressions of the villagers ranged from sickly fear to cold fury. Life on the edge of colonized space had its risks. Korgov Navy couldn't intercept every greedy alien slaver looking to make easy money, hitting easy targets. This one was greedier than most, going for a settlement hat-trick while it had a chance in atmosphere, like a fox grabbing chickens while the father slept. What can we do, Roy? the elder asked, weather creases in his lined face deepening to set in a determined expression putting a bold act in an attempt to give the villagers courage. They approach in broad daylight, already having hit two other settlements, mused Roy. Confident like, they'll be heavily armed for sure, I won't expect resistance. The villagers hung on his every word, desperately united in the face of the alien threat. All and young, they stood together. Roy looked to his family, wife and daughter, mimicking the elder's determined face, daring to hope, hoping for an answer. All right! Chagask prepared the ship for landing. His headache had faded at last. The cargo had finally fallen silent. No doubt that they would kick up again as soon as they added a lot to the hold, though. Human captures were almost more trouble than they were worth. 
Almost. At 10,000 credits per person, Chagask could put up with a little shouting. Landing preparations complete. Checks complete. Would you like to proceed with landing? Yes, yes, Chagask responded to the computer. He made his way down to the landing bay, where the rest of the crew had gathered. Guns ready, lads, he roared. Slotting his scratched exoskeleton into place, bone plate sliding into position around four black eyes. The ships landed just outside the village. The fourteen of them walked up the hill through fertile farmland, abandoned, half-tilled. A dog ran up to them, snarling, fierce, jaw-snapping. Chagask fed it with a tungsten slug. Railgun coolidge vapor curled up around him, making him seem a supernatural specter come to bring ruin. Laughing, the village was silent. <laughs> Humans! Chagas relied on his translator to get the message across. His crew blasted holes through primitive brick and mortar. You have two options. Get out here and kneel, or we will drag your corpses out. They walked into the village center. There was a small square and a town hall. A cloud cover broke, shining sunlight pouring through the highlight of a group in gold. Chagas stopped. What the fuck are the... Half a mile away, Roy pushed the detonator. The microfusion mines that he'd planted a decade ago took it instantly. Neutrons fired at uranium-235 caused an exponential reaction, opening, for a brief moment, the gates of hell on the hilltop. Within a millisecond of detonation, the village was vaporized. The villagers crowded around Roy, raising his false sight. The mines, the escape tunnel, all had been his idea at the founding of the village. And you all called me paranoid, <laughs> said Roy, laughing. But the village, the farmland, we're alive, free. Come, let's go release the captures from the ship. We can rebuild again. End of story. This is a special thank you to the one, the only, the legendary Erak he know who has become the only Tier 6 patron. I just want to thank the T5 patrons and channel members. Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Australia the Dreamer, Try Again 95, Pure Giol, Meridian 117, Elysia, Jordan Buxbaum, Angry Marine, Albarden Gasta, and Barky. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below, both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.